Some people say that the word dharma is uh, a Sanskrit non-translatable. I disagree. It has effectively been translated, and not just by uh, Western busybodies like myself, but uh, by the dharmic people themselves. Look at the Greek translation. Dharma is translated as eusebeia. Eusebeia can be analyzed as uh, consisting of eu, which means good. It's related to the Sanskrit prefix su, sebomai. The verb sebomai means to revere. So eusebeia means to tend towards a worshipful attitude. Eusebeia also means uh, spiritual maturity as opposed to dussebeia, which means uh, non-spirituality, mindlessness or irreverence. Yes, uh, good morning or evening or night or noon, wherever you are. But I, um, I welcome you all to this uh, little talk about Dharma and Moksha. These are two different concepts and they are often getting confused, especially in the West where I live where many people who practice yoga who do something that in India would be classified under moksha or the pursuit of moksha, liberation, call it dharma. And there is a point to that, but it's not entirely accurate. So it's an occasion to uh, explain the concept of dharma as well as the concept of moksha. So. If you're not interested in those topics, you can maybe use your time more profitably, <laughs> but here we're going to deal with those. Now, the first word to discuss is neither dharma nor moksha. It is arta, usually pronounced in India as rita or in South India as ruta, but actually pronounced arta. It uh, is derived from a verb meaning to go, so it literally means the going, the pattern of motion, the sequence or the order in which things uh, follow one another. It especially refers to the orderly movement of the constellation that follow each other in a fixed order. So you see them passing by in the sky and therefrom you get the notion of a natural order of the natural law. So the very, very, very basic concept of natural law, which underlies all science, uh, is already present in the earliest uh, Rig Veda, which deals with this, uh, this notion. Therefrom, it comes to mean truth. The um, usual word for truth is uh, Arta slightly distinguished from satya, which nowadays is the usual word for truth. There is a famous saying which has become India's national motto, satyam eva jayate, and so it adds to, you know, the, the, the full slogan adds the term na anarta, not untruth. So there it uses the, uh, the word arta in the meaning of truth and as effectively a synonym of satya. And so the whole, the whole sentence says, truth verily prevails, not untruth. It's a descriptive term, that is to say, it, it describes the world as it is. That's what natural law does. See, it doesn't contain a judgment. Let's uh, explain a bit more about this notion of Arta. Arta is uh, personified as the god Varuna. Varuna is the lord of the heavenly hosts. Uh, interestingly, at the same time, Varuna stands for the ocean on earth, as well as for the heavenly ocean, which both have a feeling of infinite space. 
traditionally, but we have no Vedic depictions. So this depiction is, is post-Vedic. But so as far as we can go back, he is depicted on a makara. Now the meaning of makara is uh, again a bit uh, discussed. Uh, a makara means an animal that emerges from the sea. So it can mean a crocodile, which notoriously hides just under the water and can come up very dangerously. It also means a dolphin, which, you know, typically jumps out of the water. Intriguingly, Makara is also the Sanskrit name for the constellation of Capricorn. Capricorn, likewise, depicts an animal arising out of the water, <laughs> namely a kind of goat, which has a, the tail of a fish. You know, it's called, you know, or you might call it the goatfish. But so it also depicts an animal arising out of this, the, the water. It's, you know, <laughs> symbolically, as astrologers tell me, uh, means the principle of emergence. And um, so not creation, but emergence. You know, the fact that things arise out of the chaotic, you know, basic uh, existence. It gets a more definite, more precise character. It emerges. In uh, Iran, the same word becomes Asha or Arta. Arta is the, you know, ancient form, which you may know from the name Artaxerxes, who is one of the emperors of the Persian Empire. The Iranians, the northern Iranians or Scythians, uh, had expanded all the way to Central Europe on the borders of the Roman Empire. And so some of them, in times of hardship, took service. Uh, some Iranian names are derived from this concept, do contain this concept, you know, pretty profound philosophical names like Artaxerxes, possibly the name Arthur. There is a theory, and I am inclined to accept it, that the... Um, famous British hero King Arthur was modeled on, I mean, he may not be a historically precise description, but was based on a character that really existed, namely a veteran of the Roman army who took up the defense of Britain once the Roman armies have, had left Britain. Uh, because at some point there was a crisis in the Roman Empire, and so the legions returned to Rome, left Britain to itself. And so the only ones who were capable of taking up the defense when these Anglo-Saxon tribes invaded were these veteran Roman soldiers. So one of them was this Artorius, as his Latinized name uh, sounds, so this Artorius was the Latinized form of an Iranian name, again starting with Arta, because the Iranian Scythians had expanded all the way from Afghanistan to somewhere like Hungary, Hungary, Croatia. And uh, so one of them had taken service in the Roman legions and he was posted in, in Britain. And so there, you know, with a lot of embellishment and so on, of course, the story grew of uh, King Arthur. That's a theory. Anyway, so this name Arta, or in closer uh, history Asha, means the same concept, Arta. He is um, ruled by Varona, who gets the form of address in Iranian, Ahura Mazda. The Sanskrit form would be Asura Medha, which means Lord Wisdom. So that's a form of address of Varuna, whom we know from the Vedas. That Varuna gradually dwindled in importance 
in the course of Vedic history might be linked to his association with the Asuras, which was one type of gods, different from the, from the Devas. And this has to do with the war between the Vedic people and the Iranians, which you find famously in the Battle of the Ten Kings, described in the seventh book of the Rig Veda, um, where the uh, Iranians get defeated by the Vedic people. And so they, um, and this war took uh, several generations. And so in the course of this war, already early on, the um, Iranians reject the main god of the Vedic people, namely Indra, and the Devas as a whole, the whole family of gods called the Devas, they reject, they demonize. They, they become sort of devils, and the main devil is Indra. Indra, also known as Angra Manyu, or in later Persian, Ahriman. Now, Angra is a pun on the clan of priests who serve uh, Indra, namely the Angiras. Right? At the same time, it has a meaning, Angra, which is practically the same as English angry. Coincidence. And um, then Manyu is one of the names of Indra, you know, the, the spirit. So uh, they demonize Indra. They are defeated, so they, they are really angry at the Vedic people. In the opposite sense, it is much less acute, because after all, the Vedic people are the winners in this particular war, so they don't have much resentment about it. Nevertheless, you do notice that Varuna decreases in importance and gets gradually shunted you know, away. Uh, but so he is part of the Vedic pantheon, and as such, uh, he is uh, one of the Adityas. The Adityas are the heavenly gods, 12 in number, classically. And so the number 12, of course, is a very heavenly number. Later it becomes the number of zodiac signs. Uh, in Greece, also in the Pantheon, we have the heavenly or Olympic gods, called the Greek Dodecatheon, 12-fold gods in the Germanic pantheon and so on. I mean, it's very common that the number 12 is associated with the gods. So he's the first one among them. And so, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, closer study should be made of the relation between these 12 gods and the zodiac, but that's another topic. The uh, main symbol of Arta is the swastika. Mm -hmm. Now, swastika literally means uh, auspiciousness, and a, a sign of auspiciousness. So it could be any sign that has that function of signifying auspiciousness. Like in Tibetan, you have the eight lucky signs. Uh, like, for instance, the eternal knot in Sanskrit, Sri Vatsa, is one of them, is also a lucky sign. Or, for instance, in Egypt, you have the Eye of Horus, you have the, um, the Ankh, which is a, a cross, where one side of the cross is a circle, so the, the, the Egyptian cross. Uh, so those are all lucky signs. So strictly speaking, the term swastika could refer to any of them. But in practice, swastika means this particular sign, which is known in English as the hooked cross or which is known in Greek as the gammadion, referring to the shape of the letter gamma, which is the letter g. And so it's shaped a, a straight line and a flat line, perpendicular. And so the four arms of the swastika have that shape. Um, so the swastika is a symbol of arta. It shows the heavenly cycles. You see, you know, the, the planets, the stars move around. And so it has a vertical axis and a horizontal axis, which may be likened in astronomy 
to the solstitial axis and the equinox axis as a symbol of eternity because the, the, the heavenly cycles maybe they're not eternal but they're certainly eternal vis-a-vis -vis our own very short life you know they've been there before we were born they'll still be there when we die um, so that, that eternity, that stability over an enormously long period of time is signified by its standing upright. The usual swastika in India or in Japan or so, wherever it has a deep uh, significance, uh, is standing upright. And it's in a sunny color. You know, a, a real, a normal swastika in Asia is yellow or orange or red it's not black except you know in in black and white print maybe you know you, you have no other choice but to make it black but normally it has a sunny color and so all hindu sects uh, or related uh, do use the swastika it's also it was in china in japan and so on perhaps even before Buddhism came in those countries. It's also used by the Native Americans. Uh, it was also used by the ancient Greeks, the Trojans. It's still used in the Baltic, in, in Lato, uh, Latvia, in Finland, and so on. Um, so it's a very common symbol, like in the official emblem of Jainism, you have below a hand and up there a swastika, uh, which of course is difficult to navigate nowadays in the West where people have a wrong opinion about the swastika. And so you may contrast it with the association that people usually have with the Nazi use of the swastika. So, you know, you have people who are rather ignorant of world cultures who associate this uh, swastika with the Nazi movement. Now there are some difficult, some some uh, differences, and they may help Hindus in the West to um, to avoid this mistaken association with National Socialism. The Nazi swastika was black, very deliberately black. It's not because of black and white print no you see there's red in the design the, the the background is red so there was red available they might have made the swastika red but they chose not to the swastika in in the nazi case was designed by hitler himself you know who was a bit of a visual artist a painter so he thought you know he would do it just right but so he chose a black swastika, which is a bit, you know, unnatural. Moreover, rather than a swastika standing straight, he chose to put it on one angle. So it's uneasily balancing, which may explain why the Nazi system, which was meant to last a thousand years, only lasted for 12 years. You know, it's very, very uneasy, unpractical to balance on one angle like that. A related symbol is the Sri Chakra, um, a six-pointed star. It's also known as the Shad Yantra. A yantra literally is a machine, a, a, an instrument that you control. Uh, but it's uh, in practice also used for a geometrical figure. And so a geometrical figure that is shad, six, okay, refers to a six-pointed star. In India, it happens to depict also the whole year in the sense that there are six seasons. That's not the case everywhere. In some polar regions, you have only two seasons, or in some deserts, in other countries, you have four. And so in the case of India, you have six seasons, and they are also depicted um, here, but I mean there are more basic uh, geometrical reasons why this is a unique figure. 
uh, as you know, uh, this is very elementary geometry, anybody can understand it. If you make a circle and then you take your compass in the same width and you make a circle using any point on the circumference as the new midpoint, so you make a new circle and then where the two circles intersect, that's the next midpoint, you make another circle and so like this you can create six circles around the original circle and then if you um, unite all the intersection points with straight lines the figure you get automatically naturally is the six-pointed star and so that's that's the geometrical operation that is perfectly shown in the Sri Chakra also because one of the intersecting points is the original middle point which is depicted here. You know, you don't have just a six-pointed star, you also have a dot in the middle. So that's a tantric symbol signifying the male and the female principle, which when they come together, create the principle of something new, signified here by the dot in the middle. It um, has a big likeness to the David star, the Magen David. Uh, which is now the symbol of uh, Judaism. It so happens that the very first mention of the Jews in non-Jewish sources happens to be Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, who described the Jews as descending from the philosophers of India. Now, I wouldn't take that too literally, that's what Aristotle thought. But anyway, it's, it's a nice coincidence, you see, linking uh, the Jews with their profound symbolism to India with its profound symbolism, you know, philosophical. Now we come to what we had set out to discuss, namely Dharma. So Dharma comes from a root dhar, which means to bear, to support, to carry, to sustain, or to keep. It is related to the Latin word firmus, so that's originally pronounced zirmus, but you see the Romans were a bit sloppy in their pronunciation, so that became firmus. It's also related to the German word tragen, which means to carry, to sustain. It's symbolized by a bull standing firm. Now, this concept is not so much descriptive, it is normative. Dharma is something that you should observe, that you do not automatically observe. There is very much adharma. There is very much uh, denial or ignoring uh, the, the normative principle, that the fact that you should do certain things and should abstain from certain other things. So dharma is not automatic. It signifies a norm that you have to maintain or a target that you have to achieve. Its degree of intensity varies with uh, successive uh, periods of time. Uh, in India, called yugas, the word yuga actually uh, means uh, union in the sense of the union of two planets that form a cycle. The, the best known one is that between sun and moon. You see, on the, the empty moon day, um, the Amavasya, uh, the sun and the moon are conjunct. Then they move away from one another. The moon moves away from the sun. You have the waxing moon for 14 days. Then you get the full moon. Then you have the waning moon. And then they meet again. So one month is the yuga of the sun and moon. The concept of yuga is very old and not even uh, only exclusive to India. You have the Greek uh, four world ages and the Germanic four world ages, but they have initially no specific number of years allotted to them. Like in the case of the moon, it's only one month. In the case of any two other planets, it's another figure. Like, for instance, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn happens every 20 years. So in their case, their yuga is 20 years. So you have any number of 
possible quantities of years. Uh, so the Greeks or the Germanic people don't mention any number of years associated with the yugas. In India, originally also they don't. Uh, it's only uh, after the precessional cycle, it's another complicated concept, gets known around the time of Christ that then specific numbers of years are ascribed to the yugas. Anyway, the yugas are much older and so in India they are called the, I'll start at the end, the Kali Yuga is the period of strife, of quarrel, what the Greeks call the Iron Age, what the Germanic people call the Wolf Age. So that's the worst period. Earlier than that, because it's a descending, it's a descending series, earlier than that you have the Dvapara Yuga. Symbolically in the Kali Yuga, this bull, you know, that signifies stability, is actually very uneasy standing on only one foot. That's why it's the worst age. In the Dvapara Yuga, it's standing on two feet, which corresponds to the meaning of the word Dvapara. Um, and then in the Treta Yuga, the earlier period, it's standing on three feet. In the best age, the Karta age, it's standing on four feet, as it should. Now these names, Kali, Dvapara, Treta, and Karta, are taken from a game of dice, where the dice um, have, well, they have six sides, but only four sides are used. So Kali means strive in the sense that if you throw only one, you have achieved nothing, and for you the game is yet to start. Hopefully next time you throw more. Dvapara is two quarters, you know, is a, a little better. Treta is three, and in Kurta, if you throw four, then the game is finished, then you have won. So in that sense it is called Kurta, finished. So for the Greeks this is the Golden Age, next comes the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, in the Germanic system, you first have the Spear Age, then the Sword Age, the Wind Age, and the Wolf Age. So it is a declining order of four, and so it, it corresponds to the quality of uh, Dharma in those ages. Anyway, you need not worry about it, because in a sense, any age can be, can be the, the, the worst age or the best age, depending on what you make of it, or what the circumstances make of it. The conventional meaning of dharma is uh, Hinduism in the broadest sense. The name dharma can also be used for Buddhism, for Jainism, for Sikhism, and for every other pagan tradition, any other non-Christian, non-Muslim tradition born in India. This is, in fact, the historical definition of Hinduism. You see, Hindu originally in uh, Persian, just meant India or Indian. It was a purely geographical term. But when the Muslim invaders brought the term into India, it acquired a religious meaning. It meant every Indian who is not a Muslim. And so they didn't ask questions, you see, are you a Buddhist, are you a low caste or high caste, are you a tribal? That didn't matter. All those people were non-Muslims, so they were destined to go to hell unless they converted. And so they were all taken together, so they were automatically Hindu. And so, you know, all these, all these uh, quarrels in the modern age, you know, are Buddhists Hindus, are Sikhs Hindus, and so on, they are completely irrelevant if you consider the historical definition. The word Hindu encompasses all these different uh, branches of Indian paganism, Indian unbelief. However, Hindus themselves correctly point out that the term Hindu is not really a Hindu term. It was given to them by outsiders, and they prefer a different term, namely Sanatana Dharma. Actually, just Dharma, uh, but um, Vyasa and, uh, well, Vyasa, the theoretical writer of the Mahabharata, at any rate the Mahabharata, 
And also the Buddha do say this dharma is sanatana. It's eternal. So they call it the eternal dharma, the sanatana dharma. Uh, this terminology has certain implications. Whereas the word Hindu is strongly related to the country India, even though it has more than a simply geographical definition, at any rate, it also has the geographical dimension. It means any form of unbelief born in India. Whereas this doesn't refer to India, which is original, I mean, which, which is the, the original version, because you see, the first people who used this term had no uh, consciousness yet of. India as we now know it, they didn't know of the subcontinent, you know, they lived in a very small area, the Vedic people lived in a little statelet uh, in northern Haryana, between the Saraswati and the Darshadwati rivers, more or less what is now Kurukshetra, and then later generations of this dynasty, the Bharata dynasty, expanded their territory to more or less northwestern India. Even then it was not all of India. Then other kings in South India and so on, they were impressed with this tradition. So they brought its practitioners over. They invited them. There were no conquests, on the contrary. And so the, the Vedic culture spread all over India. And so the name Bharata or Bharatvarsh also came to apply not just to the original King Bharata's territory, not just to Northwest India, but to the whole subcontinent. And so from then on, the term Sanatana Dharma and the term Hinduism more or less coincide. Uh, but if you look at the original meaning, it doesn't specifically refer to India, and correctly so. Because the rishis didn't say, okay, you know, we, we worship uh, we worship Agni, but it's only for Indians. They never say any such a thing. You see, we human beings, you know, of the power of a tribe, but we, we worship Agni, we worship Indra and so on. No one is excluded. And this is not a particular virtue of tolerance or pluralism or so on. No. It just didn't occur to them to exclude anyone. I mean, the fire is a reality for any human being. You know, the, the starry sky is a reality for any human being. So, in that sense, Sanatana Dharma applies to anyone who, you know, espouses it, who confesses to it. Now, let's take a more analytical look at Dharma. Dharma has two dimensions, a vertical one and a horizontal one. In the vertical direction, it means all for the sacred. It means the correct relation with the whole, with the universe. It uh, reminds me of a sentence spoken by uh, a German philosopher who actually had contempt for Hinduism. He wrote a very critical book about the Bhagavad Gita, namely Hegel. But nevertheless, he had his lucid moments. And so one really beautiful phrase of his is, das wahre ist das ganze, meaning the true is the whole. If you want to make a true statement, you have to take the whole into account. If very many people are obsessed with something that is only a part of the whole, and they don't see it in its real dimension because they are not aware of the whole. Um, so that's a profound insight, and that you know is is you know innocently somehow related to the concept of dharma. Dharma, in this sense, means religio, as the original Latin term from which we get the English word religion. But it didn't have the same meaning as religion has today. Religio is defined by the Roman pre-Christian philosopher and politician uh, Cicero, 
as meaning scrupulousness, utmost attention. This meaning is somewhat retained in English, namely in the phrase religiously. To do something religiously means to do something with utmost attention. It is what in uh, Hindi they call dhyanse, to do something dhyanse, to do something meditatively. So that's the original meaning of religio, it's all for the sacred. So it differs from religion in the Christian sense. The Christians took this word and gave it another meaning, namely adherence to a doctrine, a belief system. So they themselves started a belief system, you have to believe in Jesus, in his resurrection, and so on. So they, they had a, a few truth claims, a few beliefs, and either you adhere to them, then you are inside the religion, or you don't, and then you're an unbeliever. So the, uh, the pre-Christian Romans didn't have that notion, and so their religion was, was open-ended. And uh, so for Christians, it means a belief system. And so most people nowadays who use the word uh, religion give it the Christian meaning. The second dimension of dharma, the horizontal dimension, means the correct relation to the other parts of the whole. Not to the whole itself, but to the other parts. That is to say all the other beings, not only human beings the correct relation to animals, the correct relation to nature. This is what we call ethics. And so you have secular conceptions of the ethics, of ethics where there is no, no uh, talk of uh, the sacred, where nothing above the fellow beings is taken into account. Or it may be related to the religious dimension also. But at any rate, in itself, it means ethics. It means the correct um, conduct vis-a-vis -vis the other beings. It is like in modern Hindi, you say, um, when you, you have to do something, when you explain why you, you are going to do something, you say, Ye mera dharam hai. This is my duty. So in, in many systems around the world, it's not uncommon to fuse ethics with devotion to the divine. Only while it is very common, it's not necessary. There are atheists, uh, and not only in the West, uh, like in China, for example, in Confucianism, you get this very strongly. Uh, you get a notion of the secular as sacred. You don't need to posit any gods, any, any upper world. No, you see, the world as it is is sacred enough and is certainly a sufficient basis for ethics, for duty vis-a-vis -vis the other creatures. Uh, what do you do if you decide to live dharmically? Well, one very pleasant application of dharma is the duty to celebrate festivals. You see, in, um, in the West, in the post-Christian age, you have many people who don't celebrate festivals. And I confess, you see, on many a Christmas Eve, I just sit behind my computer working. I don't celebrate. Um, on, you know, a very secular festival is a New Year's Eve. And that is being celebrated, at least by others. And so, when midnight approaches and I'm still behind my computer, I hear out on the streets, you know, crackers go off and so on. And then I go out for a minute to, you know, wish uh, a happy new year to my neighbors. But so that's not dharmic. Well, that little bit is dharmic. But so in general, my abstinence from festivals is not dharmic. It is dharmic to punctuate the important moments of the year by participating. In um, the Indian Republic's legislation, there has been a controversy about how to translate the word secularism. So some people have proposed 
dharma nirpeksata. Nirpeksata meaning neutrality. So the neutrality vis-a-vis -vis dharma. Now there what is implied is the Christian reading of religion translated as dharma. So what they mean is neutrality regarding Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, uh, Mazdaism and whatever may be present in India. Um, and so Hindus reject that strongly. They say, no, what you really mean is Pantanir Pekshata, neutrality regarding the path, regarding the sect, regarding the religious community that you belong to. So in that sense, the Indian state, you know, even if it is a Hindu state, it should be neutral. It should accept these different sects and not, uh, you know, give advantage to the one over the other. And that's why traditionally in uh, Hindu states you had patronage by a Shaiva king for the Buddhists, for the Jains and so on. You know, you had this, this pluralistic attitude that different sects were, were allowed to flourish side by side. So in that sense, Panta Nirpeksata is fine. Dharma Nirpeksata is not. You see, Dharma is, is an is a uh, necessary, a much needed part of public life. Uh, this is to be explained because uh, the Indian uh, political level is heavily influenced by Christians, partly because uh, the constitution and the, the, the law system uh, continues the laws imposed by the British like the uh, constitution is, is uh, to a very large extent a reproduction of the British Government of India Act 1935. Partly is indirectly because the Nehruvian elite was very anglicized, so they, they still carried along a number of uh, Christian notions. Um, for example, the principle freedom of religion to which any Hindu would assent is a bit perverted by the Christian implication. It's also the right to convert, the right to propagate your religion. I see this notion is un Hindu, it's even more un Parsi. You see, in Hinduism, you do have some conversion, particularly on the case on, on the occasion of marriage. You see, if you marry into a particular Hindu family, it means that you automatically are considered as part of that family, part of the caste, part of the you know traditional duties that that particular community has. But there is no practice of seeking converts of trying to get people to convert. In the case of the Parsis, it's even more extreme. They do not accept converts. So if there is an interreligious marriage, it is understood that the Parsi partner automatically becomes a member of the spouse's religion. I guess today now, because of the demographic uh, need of the Parsi community, they are more lenient in this regard, but this is the traditional practice. Um, so anyway, there is a lot of Christian influence there, and so that explains the term Dharma Nirpeksata, which is a very heavy uh, uh, Christian uh, laden. So with the Christians, the word religion uh, implies a box type division into different religions, and so that meaning is carried over into dharma and many people who are not very rooted in Hindu tradition, you know, take it over like that. Whereas in reality, dharma uh, refers to a continuous landscape of religiosity. The word um, dharma often gives rise to lists of virtues that you should practice, you know, duties and prohibitions. Uh, it corresponds, in fact, quite well to the uh, Roman notion of the mos maiorum, which means the um, 
the customs of the ancestors. And the ancestors were, of course, people who led a real life, who experienced in practice that certain virtues really are useful or necessary to a harmonious uh, life in society. If in a society everybody steals from one another, you know, if people take the freedom to kill one another and so on, that leads to lots of problems. So they learn in practice that, you know, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, and so on. Now, th those experiences are summarized in lists of virtues that you should practice. And so here it's important to stick to the real meaning of dharma. In, um, you know, in some Western translations or in the use made of the word dharma by Hindus estranged from Hindu tradition, like for instance the Khalistanis, who is a particular separatist uh, group among the Sikhs. You have the notion of dharma yudha, interpreted as a holy war, a jihad. You know, a, a war for your own religion against other religions. Now, that's not at all the meaning of Dharma Yudha in the Dharmic tradition. A Dharma Yudha means a war of righteousness, a chivalrous war, a just war. For example, the Bangladesh War of 1971 was very much a Dharma Yudha, not because it was a war against Muslims, to the extent that the Pakistani army and uh, the Jamaat the Islami and so on, its local allies, uh, can be pigeonholed as Muslim. So, not because it was a war with Muslims as adversaries, after all, in the Indian army there were also Muslims, but because it went against a terrible infraction of Dharma or against Dharma, uh, a very dharmic uh, conduct, namely the genocide, the mass rapes and so on that were being conducted by the Pakistanis in Bangladesh in 1971. So when the Indian army intervened, it was effectively in the service of justice in order to avert, to stop gross injustice. And another rule for a dharma yudha or a just war is that it's a limited war. And so here, effectively, uh, nobody was troubled except the army that committed all these crimes. And even they, you see, when they gave up, when they raised their hands, when they threw away their guns, they were simply taken in custody and uh, they were not given any more trouble than just keeping them imprisoned until the politicians had conducted negotiations and then they were let, allowed to go home. So, it, you know, this was really a case of a Dharma Yudha, an ethical war, a just war. And so it was not a holy war, it was not a jihad at all. Anyway, uh, where was I? Yes, so the, 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 the rules of virtues um, that are typical for dharma, uh, you have to distinguish between the samanya dharma or sadharana dharma, which is the universal dharma, the rules that count for everyone. You see, there are certain do's and don'ts that everyone should apply. This starts with, you know, we talked about the festivals. There are certain universal festivals that everybody participates in, Diwali, uh, Holi, and so on. Uh, and so there are certain rules like non-stealing, like speaking the truth, and so on, that everybody should abide by. And then you have Vishesha Dharma or Swadharma, the specific duties, the specific prohibitions, the specific uh, taboos, that count for specific age groups or classes. You see, the rules are not the same whether you're a, an adult or a child. They're not the same whether you're a man or a woman. 
they're not the same whether you're a military man or a civilian and so on. Typically, there are also festivals associated with these specific groups. Okay, now to talk about this universal dharma, here you get lists of rules. Like, for example, you have uh, the Buddha asking every neophyte to swear allegiance to five uh, precepts, the Panchashila, the, the five rules. Uh, which are non-violence, truth-speaking, non-stealing, chastity, and non-intoxication. Or you have ten rules in the Manu Smriti, which we will look at into a moment. You have to distinguish these lists from the biblical Ten Commandments. You see, they are very well known. Most people will take them as an example of these dharmic lists of virtues, but that's not entirely correct. The biblical Ten Commandments are pictured as written on two stone tables, and for good reason, because they are, in fact, two, two different systems brought together. You see, the second one is just a list of ethical rules. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and so on. They are age old. We didn't need God to descend from the mountain, you know, to give these rules and so on. They were very well known, um, and they were very respected, even by people who didn't follow them. Even they accepted that, you know, these are good rules, accepted, you know, I think I have reason to disobey. Uh, but so they were universally respected. And in this case, they were mentioned to confer respectability on the first part of the Ten Commandments, which are not commandments, which are a new theology, where God says, you see, I am a jealous God, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall make no graven images of the divine. So it's a monotheistic and iconoclastic theology, which is quite new. There is some of it already present uh, in the system of the Egyptian pharaoh uh, Akhenaton, but in world history, mostly these Ten Commandments given to Moses are really a, um, a breaking point. So there you have the start of monotheism and iconoclasm. And so that theology is given respectability by linking it with these lists of virtues. So in India you have Dharma in its pure form with a real list of virtues and nothing else. Uh, the lists may differ a little bit one to another. The classical one, the most cited one, is in the Manu Smrti, so there you have ten virtues called, uh, or named as dharti, or patience, shama, or forgiveness. It's a very well-known term. If you apologize for something, you say, kshama kijie, huh? please practice forgiveness, huh? forgive me. Dhamma, or self-control, discipline. Asteya, non-stealing, or honesty. Shaucha, cleanliness. Indriya Nigraha, sense control, to be the master over your uh, senses. Dhi, which is attention. Vidya is knowledge. Satya, truthfulness. And a very important one, Akrodha, non-anger, you know, or equanimity. So, do practice these. Some people say that the word dharma is uh, a Sanskrit non-translatable. I disagree. It has effectively been translated, and not just by uh, Western busybodies like myself, but uh, by the dharmic people themselves. You have the rock edicts of the emperor Ashoka, not only throughout India, but also in Afghanistan on the border with the Greek uh, kingdoms. The text there 
is not just in Prakrit, the language of Ashoka's empire, but also in Aramaic, the language of the Persian empire, and in Greek. Now let's look at the Greek translation. Dharma is translated as Eusebeia. Eusebeia can be analyzed as uh, consisting of E, which means good. It's related to the Sanskrit prefix su, and the same meaning. So this su is the original form. In Greek, often you get a vowel in front of the initial consonant for linguistic reasons that we need not go into. So this becomes esu, and then the s in between two vowels sometimes disappears. So you get eu. So this means good or tending towards. And then sebomai. The verb sebomai means to revere. So eusebea means to tend towards a worshipful attitude, all for the sacred, or piety, you know, a reverential uh, attitude, which is the defining core of religion, which is obviously broader than just uh, venerating the personifications of certain natural phenomena or virtues, namely the gods. You know, it's, it's accepting that there is a sphere higher than yourself. But so usually it'll mean conduct pleasing to the gods uh, or to others above you, like in filial piety. This is a notion from Confucianism, but easily applicable everywhere else. You see the natural reverence for your parents. Sibeya also means uh, spiritual maturity as opposed to dussebea, which means uh, non-spirituality, mindlessness or irreverence. This Eusebea is sometimes personified as the wife of nomos or law. So the laws are, are hard, are specific. You can easily see whether you are acting against the law or according to the law. You see, this, um, this Eusebea, this Dharma, is a more soft concept, uh, but essentially it provides the attitude that makes you observe the law. It also means right conduct towards others, exactly like Dharma, others being both relatives and strangers. And so the word Eusebea effectively means both religion and ethics, which is quite like dharma. Another translation of the word dharma we find in Arabic. You have a Semitic root, uh, dal, ya, nun, d-i-n, which signifies both a system of belief and a system of conduct, both religion and law. In Hebrew, where this root, of course, also exists, uh, it gravitates more towards the meaning of ethics, the correct relation to others, the law. And indeed, the word deen there means, or the, the root deen means to judge. The um, derived substantive dina means judgment. And a dayan is a judge. In Arabic, by contrast, deen uh, gravitates more towards the meaning of religion though it still has an ethical meaning also, meaning a debt or an obligation, which is closely related to the meaning duty. But so the usual meaning is uh, religion. Arabic paganism is called the Deen al-Abaika, or the Dharma of the ancestors, the religion of the ancestors. This, uh, this meaning you may know from a term better known in India, namely the religion created by Akbar. Akbar later in life got tired of Islam, and so he created a religion which he saw as a confluence of Islam and Hinduism, taking the best from both. It's likened to the confluence of the Ganga and the Yamuna, 
And so he built a city, Ilahabad, the divine city, on the confluence of those two rivers, it's the present day Prayagraj. And so the word Deen appeared in the name of his religion, the Deen i Ilahi, the religion of the gods. Not of Allah, the God, one God, but of the gods, the, the divine sphere. But after Muhammad, uh, you get the same shift in meaning as in Christianity, namely the original word meaning religiosity becomes a religion, a specific religion around a specific doctrine. And so the, the term ad-deen, the deen, the religion means Islam. And it's in that meaning that you have all these... Uh, all these Islamic names like uh, Asaduddin, like Mr. Owaisi, is called Asaduddin, the lion of the religion, meaning the lion of Islam. You know, Kamaruddin, uh, Badaruddin, and so on, that's all referring to Islam. In China, likewise, you have a translation, Tao, the way, the pattern of conduct, uh, which refers to or you know is provides a spontaneous parallel to the word uh, urta what you see you know when you look at the sky you see certain movements regular movements and you know you could call them urta but it also refers to the practice of this heavenly order in your daily life is the way of heaven uh, practiced by people down here the um, Buddhist concept of Dharma was, of course, brought into China by Buddhism, and the Chinese translated it as Fa. Now, Buddhist terms in Chinese prove, of course, that Sanskrit words are not necessarily untranslatable, because many of them have been translated, like here, Dharma becomes Fa, but others also have not been translated. Because the Chinese found, after trying, that these Chinese words did not exactly correspond to what the Buddhists meant. And so some terms are not translated. Like the word Buddha itself is in Chinese fo. Um, so that fo is simply a phonetic, you know, a bit of a distortion. But okay, it's a phonetic rendering of Bud Buddha. Uh, but so in this case, uh, the word fa, law, means the certain things you have to do, you know, the Buddhist way, in the sense that Buddhists do not do just anything, they do specific things, and they leave off other things. Buddhism is a way of life in, you know, the elaboration of this term fa. So I would say that the idea of dharma is not that unique to India. You know, everybody has a notion of ethics and generally relates it to a, a certain religious dimension. In India, you have the specific notion of the wheel of karma. Uh, this, um, I'll not go too deeply into it, but then I can't leave it unmentioned either. Karma happens to rhyme with dharma, and you see many non-understanding Western people relate the two to each other and effectively they are related for modern Hindus. Though anciently the word karma had a different uh, meaning. Karma means action and it meant specifically ritual action. So in the, the Vedic period you had karma kanda. The um, the half of the tradition that pertains to action, namely to ritual action, to rituals. Then later you get the Upanishads, and they are called Jnana Kanda, the knowledge half, the wisdom half. There you have the deeper interpretation of the, of the texts of the tradition. Um, but so, these rituals are conceived as having an effect at a distance. You see, you practice a certain ritual today, hoping for a certain benefit, and that benefit materializes tomorrow. You know, initially in, 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 in a ritual, you express a sankalpa, 
a decision, you see, for a certain benefit. So you're going to practice this ritual in order to recover your health or in order to be victorious in a battle that is going to take place. And so hopefully the result of your yajna or your fire ritual is going to be fulfilled tomorrow. But so it means, karma means an action at a distance. An action that has an effect at a distance. And so that meaning is easily transferred to the notion of reincarnation once this is introduced. And so from there on you get the notion that the acts that you commit in this life have an effect at a distance, namely in the next life. So uh, you get the very common uh, idea that if you do something good today, you will be rewarded for it sometime in the future. Either in this life, it's not impossible, but more likely in the next life, not necessarily the immediate next life. Now, as an outsider, I immediately see a big problem with this. Because this implies that the universe is automatically, intrinsically just. It means that the universe has been designed in such a way that whatever you do, you get your reward or your punishment at some time in the future. Now, first of all, we don't see this in the world. We see many people do evil and profit. We see many people do only good and yet suffer. But, says the karma theorist, that's only an appearance. In reality, there is going to be reward or punishment, but it's invisible. It only comes up in the next life. Now, maybe so, maybe not. And so without some supernatural way of knowing, there's no way to, to decide. Uh, there are um, reincarnation researchers who especially are interested in children who claim to have memories of a past life. So they try to check if this is true, if this is based on anything and so on. For what it is worth, you see, I note that these uh, researchers never speak about retribution, never speak about uh, punishment or reward, but they do speak about a connection between successive lives. Like someone who was an airplane pilot and who dies in action, gets reborn, with an otherwise unexplainable desire from childhood onwards to become an airplane pilot again. Hmm. Uh, so, I, I mean, this is a very interesting topic for research. I'm not going to uh, give a final uh, judgment about this. Um, but so what it has to do with dharma is that it helps keep people on the straight and narrow it helps people do their duty and avoid you know, what, is, uh, what is less desirable. But so this is a very common Hindu belief. Um, I think there is no necessity to adopt that belief. The Vedic Rishis had no such notion. You know, in the Vedas you don't find it. There you simply find the idea that people go to heaven and then you know, it's up to the gods. You have a notion of Swadharma. In the Bhagavad Gita, it's uh, made much of. You have your own duty. Now, there, Swadharma is not something individual. It's a sectional thing. A particular community has certain duties. Like, for instance, Arjuna is reminded of his duty to fight because he is a Kshatriya. And so this is not an individual thing. When Westerners read the Bhagavad Gita, they often think Swadharma mirrors the Western notion of individualism, that you have a certain 
you know, reason for living that nobody shares with you. This is totally unique to you. This is expressed in the magazine by the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. There is only one way in the world that no one can go except you. Don't ask where it leads, follow it. So this individualistic notion of Swadharma is not obviously Hindu. And yet, once the notion of karma is introduced, it may get that individual uh, meaning. Why? Because the weight of all the acts you have committed in your past lives adds up to something unique. And so if that has consequences for your present life, it means that the events and things to do in your present life are unique. You know, you may share certain things with the community of people, but altogether, you see, the combination of everything is unique. So in that sense, you could say, well, maybe Swadharma is unique to you. Is it something very individual? So this meaning of Swadharma, of your own duty, is not what the tradition in the Bhagavad Gita makes of it. There it is a sectional duty, but it's reasonable to extend it to a strictly individual duty. Anyway, this is, this is stuff for uh, serious brainstorming among Hindus. Now, it, it's been very interesting to take a little peep into the uh, notion of karma and reincarnation, but you see, dharma ultimately is independent of that. Regardless of reincarnation, whether such a thing exists or not, regardless of karma, whether it is real or not, whether it is retributive with reward or punishment or not, regardless of a supreme being, whether God exists or not, at any rate, there is dharma. You see, inside your home, you may have a little altar for this particular god or for another god, or you may worship no god at all or many gods or whatever. But when you go out, you pass through the front door, you come out on the street, there you have a dharma in common with everyone. There there are, to put it in modern terms, traffic rules. There are certain things you're not allowed to do. You're not allowed to go through the red light. You're not allowed to cross the street except uh, on the zebra uh, and so on. Um, so similarly, when you deal with other people, there are certain things you have to do, certain things you're not allowed to do. And that remains true regardless of what religion you practice. Another thing is that... Um, Virtues are things to do regardless of reward or punishment. It is, I think, this philosopher Spinoza who said that virtue is its own reward. You know, if you practice virtue, you know, let's say if you, you walk by a house which is open, you can go in and steal as much as you want. And you decide not to do it. You see, it feels good to practice this virtue of, you know, abstinence, of non-stealing. It is its own reward, you know, you feel better by not indulging in this vice of stealing. Regardless of whether you get rewarded for it in the next life or not. Regardless of whether some God in heaven will reward you after death or not. You see, just practicing this virtue, in this case, asteya, non-stealing, is good. It feels good. It feels right. Another aspect of virtues is that virtues can be exaggerated. You see, sometimes virtues can turn into vices if not practiced wisely. Like empathy with people can turn into sentimentalism. Like if you see beggars on the street, you may empathize with them. But then if you simply automatically give them, it may create bad habits of people who make a living as beggars and so on. So virtues can be perverted. 
Dharma as such cannot be perverted. Dharma is the correct way of doing things by definition. Okay, now all this was about Dharma. Um, I will briefly go into a different concept that sometimes contrasts with Dharma. It is Moksha. You see, these two are often, you know, confused. And so I notice among Western practitioners of yoga that they um, call the thing that they're doing Dharma. That is not entirely incorrect, but it's not precise. Another German <laughs> philosopher who became a Hindu and a Hindu Swami, namely Agehananda Bharati, um, launches the notion of the, the zero experience. And so what he means by this is that whether you're a Jain or a Buddhist or a Vedantin or so, the stuff that you pursue with your sadhana, with your spiritual path, is always the same. It's the zero experience. What differs is when you have the zero experience and then you try to explain it, you try to put it into words, you construct some worldview around it that may differ from the explanation given by someone else with a zero experience. So that's how you get Buddhism and Jainism and Vedanta and Sankhya so next to one another. They are a little different as conceptual systems, even though they're all about the same experience. And so this, uh, this zero experience is explained quite well by Patanjali. That's one of the reasons why he wrote his uh, Yoga Sutra. Um, namely, he defines what yoga is all about. He says it is uh, chitta vrti nirodha. So it is the stopping of the motions of the mind. And he defines what possible motions there are, namely sleep, true perception, false perception, you know, hallucinations and so on, when you think something is happening that is not happening, then imagination and memory. So you have to stop all those. So the state that you pursue when doing yoga is not sleep. You see this, this sort of unconsciousness in sleep? That's not yoga. Yoga is very conscious. It is not through perception. That is to say, you close your senses. Perception is through the senses. You see things, you hear things. Well, here you're not seeing, you're not uh, hearing, and so on. Not in reality, and not in the imagination either. It's not like a dream or so. It's not a vision. You see, some people say, yes, you see, uh, Ramakrishna had a vision of Muhammad. He had a vision of Jesus. First of all, that's historically very questionable. But even so, if he did, it was not yoga. It was not his state of enlightenment. A vision is something else. A vision is imagination. At least if you realize that it's only imagination. If you take it for real, then it is false perception. Then it is a hallucination. Uh, that, that's something else. Um, so it's also not memory. It's not, you know, uh, indulging in reviving what happened to you in the past. So no, it's totally in the here and now. You know, meditation is here and now. And um, anyway, so that's how Patanjali defines what yoga is all about. So it's the zero experience. It's consciousness resting in itself. Otherwise, consciousness is busy with its objects, is busy with things it perceives, things it imagines, you know, reasonings that it goes through and so on. All mental activity, whether through the senses or, you know, the mind on its own, is all the stuff you should stop in order to reach your state of what Patanjali calls Kaivalya. Kaivalya means uh, aloneness, isolation. Namely, and, and this is where his philosophical system kicks in. You know, he sees this in terms of the Sankhya philosophy. Sankhya means enumeration 
of the elements that make up the universe. And so there you have the world of consciousness and the world of nature. And so here, nature are all the objects of consciousness, not only the objects outside, but also all the thoughts you can have. So all of that has to be uh, separated from consciousness, or rather, the other way around, consciousness has to be separated from all of that, has to be disentangled from its usual uh, outward directedness. Okay, now that means that moksha, or kaivalya as he calls it, moksha is liberation, is not interested in others. And so some people may find that shocking. What? Are we not responsible for others? Well, yes, in terms of dharma, we are. We are responsible for, you know, the children we have. We are responsible for our aging parents, you know, for our sickly neighbor and so on. Yeah, we are responsible. But you see, dharma is practical. All these things are to be taken care of by society. In traditional society, it was the extended family or the caste, which is a very extended family. Uh, in modern societies, at least in the West, it's the social security system. Society as an organization that takes care of all these practical needs. But it doesn't mean that every single individual has to do that. And so, the yogi is precisely the one who takes up another duty than taking care of society. The job of the yogi is to be free, to get rid of all these entanglements in the outside world. And so, in his yogic practice, it means not not indulging in mental, you know, fantasies and so on. But its practical preparation is freeing oneself from social duties. That's why sannyasins, you know, make a living as beggars and so on, in order not to be entangled in job responsibilities, for example. Or live as celibates in order not to be entangled in family responsibilities. And so this is organized in Hindu society. You withdraw from life at a certain age. You know, in practice it is written, you know, when your last daughter has been married off. So when you have no more family responsibilities, you can withdraw. You can become a vanaprastha, a forest dweller. So this is hard to accept for moderns. But in fact, you see, Hindu society does make that... Uh, distinction. However, when you read modern Hindu textbooks, they often say that the goal of life in Hinduism is moksha. Now, I know very few people in Hindu society who care about achieving moksha. You see, this is lip service. They care about dharma, about the correct way of life in society, including the correct interaction with the gods, you know, doing puja, you know, participating in festivals. About moksha, very few are really serious. You know, they do practice some yoga, but m mainly yoga integrated in a dharmic perspective. Um, here I may uh, mention outside India, in China, in around the 11th century, you had a movement called Neo-Confucianism, which was very much directed to social duty, that's Confucianism, but that integrated some elements of Buddhism. And so, they were not interested in Buddhist, what they called superstition, namely the um, beliefs like reincarnation, for example, which the Chinese were very skeptical of. But they did see that the Buddhist practice of meditation was very useful. And so they practiced meditation every morning for an hour or so, just to, you know what they saw as, tuning your instrument. You know, you function a lot better once you have quietened the mind, 
once you have come in a meditative state, you know, if you, if you bathe yourself every morning like this in meditation, you function a lot better. You can do your social duties a lot better. And so most people who practice meditation, both in India and in the West, do it for these reasons. You see, they, they experience a benefit in daily life from practicing meditation. And so effectively their goal of meditation is not kaivalya, is not moksha, is not nirvana. The effective goal is simply to be better, to function better, to feel better. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so for most practitioners, yoga is simply part of their life in society. In this connection, and with that I'll finish, I noticed that um, many Hindu gurus, you know, in their discourses, use a notion that I, you know, being an ex-Christian, strongly associate with Christianity, namely love. Now, actually, the Christian classics don't speak of love, they speak of charity. You know, there were this agape in Greek, or caritas in Latin, which has as its most literal translation in English, charity. And love has a rather sentimental connotations. Anyway, you see, love is nowadays the usual term. And so I find that many um, Hindu teachers influenced by the ambient uh, Christianity uh, use this word love rather easily. So I, I have here a uh, quote by a certain Sri Tathata who says, Dharma is the path and love is the essence of real life. Yeah, I mean, I have nothing against love, but you see, in this context, it is a bit overrated. You see, love belongs to the world of intersubjectivity. You love another person or you love your country or so, but love is always between A and B. Now, there is no A and B in this zero experience, in this kaivalya, in this nirvana. You know, there's just consciousness resting in itself. It's not directed towards another being. So simply as a matter of intellectual hygiene, of avoiding confusion, you know, of using words in their proper meaning, I'd make a clear distinction between love, which, is, which may be part of dharma, which may be part of the correct relation between you and other beings, and on the other hand, uh, kaivalya or moksha or mukti or nirvana, which is about aloneness, which is about experiencing yourself rather than another being. So, you know, please go on, you know, um, loving and, and doing all the other dharmic things, but, you know, remember that this is something else than moksha. Yeah. And nothing will happen if you don't remember that. You know, it's just a matter of, you know, of shaucha, of purity, to make that distinction. Thank you.